So, um... A while back, I made a video in a new series that I called Cinema Antifa. It was a look at various forms of resistance through the lens of a highly non-obscure movie about resisting fascism. The comment section made me want to bathe in gasoline and light a match because that's the closest I'll ever be able to get to throwing myself directly into the sun. Because... Wow, do we need to talk. I mean, I'm not an idiot. I expected some pushback. I know a lot of people are afraid of the word Antifa, so I knew just calling it that title would leave some people bothered, offended, triggered, one might say. I'm not surprised by people's feelings about that, but if you're curious about the actual definition of Antifa, then watch Philosophy Tube's video about it here. But I'm not surprised by some people's misconceptions about the word Antifa, because I think any major misconceptions about Antifa is really based on major misconceptions about fa. F fascism. I mean fascism. Did you know that Antifa was short for anti-fascism? Because apparently so many people don't. Because there were way too many people saying that anti-fascism was in fact the real fascism. Which... Guys, come on, anti means against, and fascism means fascism. But that's where we get tripped up, isn't it? The definition of fascism. So, what does fascism mean? It sometimes seems like the only definition that everyone agrees on is the thing that Antifa hates. A definition which makes Antifa look like stupid, undiscerning maniacs who start fights with anyone who doesn't agree with them. Which is, of course, the definition that many people are using on purpose, but... Do you think that's true? Do you have this vague idea of what fascism means? Beyond a bad thing that I should oppose? Are you afraid that some crazed Antifa super soldier will label you fascist? And you can't have that because fascist means bad, and I'm not bad, therefore I can't be fascist. In other words, does this title bother you? Because if so, good. Now that I have your attention, let's get to fucking work. So I'm going to be using clips from Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will as background for this video, but this won't be a review of the movie. If you want that, check out Dan Olson's video about just that. I'm just using Trying for the Will because I thought it might be aesthetically helpful to illustrate these arguments with some of the most recognizable visual expressions of fascism in action. So let's just calmly discuss fascism while looking at all of this totally not disturbing footage of people marching. And marching. And marching. Fascism means marching. There, I solved it. First things first, what fascism is not. It is not synonymous with violence against political enemies. It is not autocracy, and it is not totalitarianism. Violence against political enemies? Um, not unique to fascism. Uh, hey, I have some bad news for you about every political system ever. It is not synonymous with autocracy. There have been autocratic rulers since there have been rulers. And yes, fascist movements usually end up as autocracies, but not all autocracies are fascist. All doggies are carnivores, but not all carnivores are doggies. Same thing with the word totalitarian, a word which describes governments that have no opposition parties, restrictions on individual protests, and complete control over public and private life. Look at Stalin. Look at Mao. Totalitarians. Absolute poop stains of people. Not fascist. And lastly, and this is especially true, fascism does not mean nothing. Unfortunately, most people's definition aligns with George Orwell's complaint in 1944 that the word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. In conversation, of course, it is used even more wildly than in print. I've heard it applied to farmers, shopkeepers, social credit, corporal punishment, fox hunting, bullfighting, the 1922 committee, the 1941 committee, Kipling, Gandhi, Chantai Shek, homosexuality, priestly broadcast, youth hostels, astrology, women, dogs, and I do not know what else. 
Except for the relatively small number of fascist sympathizers, almost any English person would accept bully as the synonym for fascist. That is about as near to a definition as this much abused word has come. This is apparently the only writing of Orwell's that people seem to fully understand. This whining, snide, non-definition, which is as true as it is useless. But he has a point. There are many small differences between fascist movements across nations. Some were anti-Semitic, some weren't. Some had imperial ambitions or colonial ambitions, some didn't. There are plenty of minor differences between the Italian fascists and the Nazis, along with the Falangists and the Eustaches and the Kislings and the Kogelards and the Metaxas regime in Greece and the ones in Hungary and Portugal and Brazil and Chile and the several dozen other fascist movements in Australia, Canada, Ireland, the Netherlands, the UK, and the US that never got beyond marching in the street and giving a few speeches. There isn't any one fascism. Obviously, Hitler's theory of German racial supremacy wouldn't play well outside of Germany. In truth, fascism is ideologically fluid, changing its playbook from one country to the next and even from one decade to the next. For just one example, early Italian fascism was militantly atheist, yet later Mussolini was willing to work closely with the Pope, even going so far as to set up the Vatican State. In practice, fascist regimes were willing to compromise in order to gain power. The only ideologically consistent forms of fascism were the ones that never gained any power. Still, we need to define it. Because you know who benefits from a fuzzy definition of fascism? Fascists. Now this search for a definition of all forms of fascism is an old one, and an elusive one. Scholar Roger Griffin called this concept the fascist minimum, the smallest amount of features required to be described as fascist. Fittingly enough, Griffin's definition of fascism is only two compound words, palingenetic ultranationalism. Ultranationalism is self-explanatory, palingenesis comes from the Greek meaning to be born again. Fascism as a form of nationalism that emphasizes the re-emergence of the nation. A central myth of national greatness that can be revitalized into a movement to become great once more. This is what makes it different from other forms of autocracy. It doesn't ignore the masses. Fascism is not the 17th century king of France declaring I am the state. The masses are the state. Fascism requires the masses. It can't exist in a society without some form of mass politics. Because despite all our fears of a tyrant, some great and terrible leader, fascism isn't defined by the authority of the leader, but the collective will with a capital W of the people who put him there. Of course, fascists have a very strict definition of the national will, and even stricter definitions of who the people are, but we'll get to that later. This idea is expressed in the symbol in the name, the fasces, a bundle of sticks representing the many parts of society, bound together and topped with an axe, representing the authority required to lead the group. The fasces, by the way, originally symbolized the Roman Republic, this is why you can find fast case engraved into the memorial of noted fascist leader Abraham Lincoln. See, symbols are weird and fluid and they can really mean anything if you set your mind to it. Now, if we really want to define fascism, we need to get rid of the familiar aesthetic tropes and individual policies of fascism. They won't help you. Just ignore the stuff that I'm putting on the screen. And we also can't look at individual policies of fascist regimes, because that's how you get, like, the Dinesh D'Souza's of the world who think that fascism is lurking inside the minimum wage or something, because Mussolini called for a minimum wage once. The truth? Most individual policies enacted by fascists in power are completely arbitrary to fascists. The goal is simply to stay in power. 
In his book, The Anatomy of Fascism, Robert O. Paxton argues that fascism is best understood not as a political philosophy in the same vein as Burkean conservatism, Lockean liberalism, or Marxist socialism, but rather a rejection of all three, based not on reasoning, but by a set of mobilizing passions. Fascism is felt, not thought. So what are those passions? Well, we finally come back to our old friend Umberto Eco, a man who, one, grew up in fascist Italy, and two, was throughout his life one of the world's leading semioticians, meaning that he studied the meaning of meaning itself. So let's treat him as a guy who knows what he's talking about. In 1995, he wrote his now famous essay, Ur er Fascism, the original fascism the set of fundamental ideas from which all fascist movements follow. And right now, it's the most popular take on how to understand the workings of the F-word. Link to the full PDF in the description. Echo laid out 14 tenets around which a form of fascism can be built. A movement can have all, or only a few of these tenets, and still be recognizable as fascist. Some of them contradict each other, some contradict themselves, but any of them taken together, can be the seeds of a fascist movement. The tenets are as follows. 1. The cult of tradition. The belief in a big centralized myth of a culture that existed throughout the centuries. The creation of a national narrative built from the present going backwards. Often the narrative is syncretic, made of deferring parts. Something ahistorical crafted in the present for the sake of national unity. Like how all nations are made, I suppose. But implied through this cult of tradition is the belief that there can be no new learning, only reinterpretation of an original obscure belief. Two, the rejection of modernism. Part of this traditionalism leads to viewing the modern world, the one created by the Enlightenment, the Age of Reason, and the first democratic revolutions, as the beginning of our decline as the place where it all went wrong. 3. The cult of action for action's sake, or a form of anti-intellectualism. Action is inherently beautiful, and thinking before taking action is a form of neutering. Critical thinking, therefore, is a sign of weakness. Nerds. 4. Disagreement is treason. Because of this faith and tradition, which is inherently syncretic and often self-contradictory, and therefore can be easily deconstructed by an analytical mind, people defending that tradition hate when you point out its flaws. 5. Fear of difference. Disagreement is a sign of diversity of thought. Ur-fascism hates diversity, because it can only operate through consensus by force, if necessary. So it always makes an appeal against the intruders. Who are these intruders? Honestly, it's entirely arbitrary. Anyone who doesn't fit. 6. Appeal to frustration. The establishment of power by appealing to a class going through economic anxieties or political humiliation or pressure from other social classes an appeal to anyone who thinks they're being treated unfairly. Of course, this group is always in the majority. 7. Obsession with a plot. To ease this frustration, Ur fascism reminds the frustrated class that they are united by the virtue of having come from the same place. And what better way to unite than by forming a common enemy? The nation must always be under siege. There's always some shadowy force working from the inside and the outside to fundamentally change our way of life. Who is this force? Again, it's arbitrary, but usually it's some kind of foreigner. 8. The enemy is strong and weak. This is where the contradictions really come in. The populace is taught two mutually exclusive ideas. One, that the enemy is humiliating us through their wealth and power. Two, that they will be easily crushed by our wealth and power. 
Through this dichotomy, the enemy is both strong enough to pose a threat, yet weak enough to defeat. Dangerous, but impotent. Again, Ur-Fascism doesn't want you to think too hard about it. 9. Life is lived for struggle. The belief that there will always be an enemy, so life is understood as permanent warfare. There is always a conflict, and always a new battle. Therefore, pacifism is working for the enemy. 10. Contempt for the weak. Not just physically weak or morally weak, this is a form of mass elitism. Everyone in the nation looks down on the other nations of the world. Everyone in the party looks down on everyone not in the party. Within the hierarchy of the party, everyone is taught to look down on their inferiors. And the leader looks with contempt on everyone, because his authority is based on the weakness of the masses. After all, if they weren't weak, they would not need a leader. 11. The Cult of Death Or, everyone can be a hero. The hero, in myth, is an exceptional figure who through struggle and sacrifice makes society better. In Ur-Fascism, everyone is taught to be exceptional. And of course, the ultimate act of a hero is sacrifice. The belief that through glorious death, we can reach transcendental happiness. In Echo's words, the Ur-Fascist hero is impatient to die. In his impatience, he more frequently sends other people to death. 12. Machismo. This is the principles of permanent war and suicidal heroism brought into sexuality. Masculine sexual dominance is valued, and everything else, from femininity, to submissiveness, to chastity, to homosexuality, to anything outside of the ideal of dominant masculinity, is shunned. 13. Selective Populism Ur-Fascism relies on the people to function. But unlike in democracy, which works for individual rights, where individuals impact political decisions through the quantitative voting process, Ur-Fascism treats the people as a qualitative function, as a monolithic voice of the common will. Since no group is a monolith, and every populace is made up of a diverse number of voices, and as mentioned before, fascism needs consensus and abhors diversity, the leader serves as the sole interpreter of this will. So the people only exist to serve as a rhetorical device, commonly used to undermine democratic institutions that, for one reason or another, no longer represent the people. And this, combined with the aforementioned racism and xenophobia, serves to narrow the definition of who the people are. Echo speculates that in the future, a TV or internet populism could also serve this function. And finally, 14. Newspeak. And we're back to George Orwell. In 1984, Newspeak was a simplified version of English that used a scant vocabulary to prevent even the thought of dissent from being voiced, which made it hard to belly feel own life as double plus good and easy to up-sub to BB, because to do otherwise would be crime-think. In Ur-Fascism, Newspeak has many different dialects, built on euphemism and cliché, which make complex and critical thought harder to apply. This is anti-intellectualism brought to the linguistic level. Newspeak makes it hard to criticize fascism. In some cases, it makes it hard to even call fascism, fascism. There are many definitions, and Echoes is only one, but it's one of the better ones we have. And it's one of the best we got that can predict the form that any modern fascist movement would take. Because should it come again, assuming it hasn't already, it will not look like this. It will not be the same endless marching in these clothes and with these symbols. Although, certain symbols do tend to reoccur. As Paxton wrote, A fascism of the future, an emergency response to some still unimagined crisis, need not resemble classical fascism perfectly in its outward signs and symbols. 
some future movement that would give up free institutions in order to perform the same functions of mass mobilization for the reunification, purification, and regeneration of some troubled group would undoubtedly call itself something else, and draw on fresh symbols that would not make it any less dangerous. The lyrics will always change. The key will change. The instruments will change. The tune will remain the same. So if I can attempt to give my own definition, fascism is best understood as a narrative told by its adherents, a self-contradicting story used to purify, unify, and mobilize a group to power. Fascism is ultimately a belief, a belief that we, as a group, are mighty, and have always been mighty, but we've lost our way and been denied our might, not because we are weak, but because a great and terrible they have made us weak. They work together, causing our decay from the inside and the out, because they want our destruction. And none of our existing systems will help us. Therefore, we need a new system. One in which we, and only we, control our fate. Only we, through eternal struggle, through purifying unity, through our inherent might, can stop them from causing our downfall. They must be stopped by any means necessary. Life is only the struggle to keep us dominant over them. All else is meaningless. But that's only my definition. If you've made it this far into the video, thanks for listening to me. I know it's not a fun thing to think about, and I know this narrative definition isn't comprehensive or complete, as all definitions are, but before I end this video, I want to ask you something. Looking at this narrative, look inside, and without judgment, without placing a moral value on it, ask yourself, does any part of you believe it? And if so, where does that belief come from? Were you born believing it? Or were you taught it 